Uh, my bio actually makes me sound younger than I am. Uh, I've been covering New York City since 1987. Before that, I worked covering Long Island, and before that, I worked covering the Hudson Valley, and I have been with the Department of Labor 34 years, um, which is hard to believe sometimes. Uh, but what I usually tell people that means is this is my third financial crisis major recession. I was around for the savings and loan crisis. I was around for that lovely little accident when they lost 22% of the stock exchange market value in one trading day. And of course, here I am again for, you know, and the dot-com bust. Let's not forget that one. So I guess it's four major market events and three major recessions. Um, they're all different, and yet somehow they're all the same. And one of the things I've, I've come to realize is, because this is the third time I've gone through the we have no job growth, it's a jobless recovery, you know, we're never gonna have job growth, whatever. I remember being here in 2004, not here physically, but in the city and the market and everyone's going, recovery's never coming. And then it came. And I remember being there in 92 and 93 and they were laying off people left and right. And by 96, the employers were calling asking me where to find workers. I'm a civil servant, so I can't say, call all the people you laid off, you know, but yeah. So we've been through, no one ever sees the booms coming. No one saw the late 90s coming. No one saw what we just went through in the previous decade coming, and absolutely nobody saw the mid 80s coming. I mean, came into, I knew about New York City coming into that. Uh, we were basically being written off as dead. I mean, all through the, from 69 to 78, New York City essentially lost Buffalo. It's the way I like to describe it. We lost more jobs than there were people working in Buffalo, or back then in Buffalo. Buffalo's smaller now, of course. Um, so we've been through this before, and somehow we keep coming out of it. And uh, I'm a pessimist by nature. I was born in New York City, raised in New York City. It's real, real simple. Um, but I've seen this go on for a long time, and the interesting thing is it's actually been getting better cycle to cycle. And that is, when I was first getting into this uh, business, it was standard for them to tell you, well, of course, New York City always underperforms the nation. We'll never do as well as the national economy. You know, they've got all that cheap land, low taxes, booming populations. How could we possibly outperform the national economy? We've got all these, you know, high taxes, expensive real estate, it's crowded, the infrastructure's lousy, all these issues. How could we possibly outperform the national economy? Well, as you can see, we did it during the last uh, cycle. We were actually stayed positive much longer than uh, the national economy, which is that black line managed. And we didn't suffer as severe losses, and we bounced back faster, and we're growing faster. So for this whole cycle, for the last almost 10 years now, the city has been outpacing the nation in job creation. And it may not feel like it, especially if you're looking for a job, it may seem incredible to have someone stand here and tell you, we're doing better than the nation. Um, some of that's how bad the nation has done. And some of it's to understand our role in things, which is we were at the end of the pipeline. Um, when the national economy started slowing, and you can see the line starts down in the middle of 2005. When the national economy started slowing, that's the housing boom starting to unwind. And of course, it hammers first those people who depend heavily on building new houses. So South Florida, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Southern California, all got hammered fairly early. Most of those states, um, Florida, whatever, uh, Arizona, were in recession by 2006. And we were still bubbling along. And then 2007 came, and it's getting nasty everywhere, and we're still bubbling along. Reporters keep calling and going, your numbers must be wrong. You know, we're still growing and everyone else is in trouble. Well, we were at the end of the pipeline. You know, first the housing goes bad, then the whole economy tanks. Then the bad housing turns into bad mortgages, and it shows up on our doorstep. So it took a long time to show up. And you can see when it arrived, it arrived with a bang. In one quarter, we went from pretty decent over-the-air job growth to a strong negative position. It happened like that. 
uh, third quarter and then into the fourth quarter of 08. It was a very fast, severe downturn. We actually came out of it much faster than usual. The recessions usually last longer in the New York City than they do nationally. And this time we did uh, better than average. And we've been hard to believe, but we are now in our entering, I guess it will be our fifth year of job growth. We just keep adding jobs. And New York City is actually back above where we were going into the recession. That is not true of the nation. We need at least another year, 18 months of good, solid economic growth nationally, and maybe we'll get back to where we were in 2007. And therein lies part of the problem, because it would be nice, you know, in economics they always have these lovely theories, and then the little line at the end says, all other things being equal. Yeah, yes, right. Because we pull out our magic economic freeze ray and we stop everything else from happening. And we test this one variable, and it's fine. It works great. Um, but in real life, of course, things just keep happening. Pieces move. So seven years go by, and every year, people keep graduating high school and college and expecting there to be jobs. I know it's darn inconsiderate of them, but they just keep doing it. So seven years of no job, net, net job growth, means you have a much higher unemployment rate. So even though New York City is right back where it was, in fact, above where it was substantially in terms of job growth, the unemployment rate is still much higher. And the red line is New York City. Um, New York City always has higher unemployment rates, pretty much. I mean, it gives you how, a, an idea of how strong our economy was in the last upturn and how bad the nation was in the last downturn, that we had similar unemployment rates. We're pretty much always above the national rate. And there were some demographic reasons for that. But, uh, that's, but you'll see it is slowly working its way down. Um, for finally down below the peak of the previous recession, which gives you an idea how nasty things got. But, you know, seven years of basically treading water and you get still high unemployment. And you see the national rate has really started to move down. Um, you get down towards six, much below six, and you start to get a lot of stories about labor shortages. Not that in general labor is short, but you start to get spot shortages. So this is the, the broad picture of how the city has done. Uh, we're, we've had four full years of economic, of job growth. 2014 looks like it's going to be a solid year. Um, and we are outperforming the nation, although the nation is starting to catch up. It's interesting because I talk to groups all the time about unemployment, and something that comes up a lot, of course, is age discrimination. And um, it surely exists. I'm a labor economist. When you study labor markets, you find massive numbers of inefficiencies. There's all sorts of discriminations, um, preferences. It's, it's sort of interesting in labor economics. In theory, every time a business doesn't hire someone because they're too short, too tall, wrong gender, wrong age, wrong color, whatever else, they're making any non-economic decision that damages their productivity. Doesn't mean they don't do it. it. Just means in economic theory, it'd be a stupid thing to do. People keep right on doing it. But the interesting thing, of course, is that you see there is some difference by age as you move up in unemployment, particularly for men, somewhat higher as you get older. But the real penalty in the labor market by age is being young. Unemployment rates are sky high for teenagers and still well over 10% for people late years of college, first years out of college. And this is consistent. You, good times and bads. The levels may move down and up, but the ratios are pretty consistent because what you're really being punished for in the labor market is lack of something to charge for. You don't have experience, you don't have credentials, you don't have whatever, whatever they're looking for, degrees, and you're lacking that. So you have this real penalty on lack of experience, lack of credentials. So as it comes down, as you get to the age where you have some work experience, where you're starting to get, get your skills packaged together, unemployment drops sharply and sort of levels off. You know, relative to the other uh, age groups. This is one of the uh, sort of nasty surprises we've had, and one of the reasons this recession has felt, or re recovery has felt so weak, is this is what's called part-time for economic reasons. 
And what it boils down to is you have a part-time job and you wish a full-time job. And at this point, we have about 4.5% of the workforce are working part-time and they wish to be working full-time. Uh, when you hear discussions or see articles where they discuss the real unemployment rate, this is the biggest factor in that. They take this and they add it to the underlying uh, traditional unemployment rate. Because presumably these people are still looking for full-time work. They want full-time work. You will notice it got particularly high in this downturn. Downturn lasted a long time in terms of getting back to where we were. People had to compromise. People had to settle. And so we have more people than usual, far more than in the previous recession. By the way, a percentage point in New York City equals like 40,000 people. Um, having to settle for a part-time job, and it's really only back down a little. It hasn't made any substantial move down. So there's still a lot of weakness in the labor market, even though we have had decent job growth. These people have had to, in many cases, settle for a, you know, a secondary job, a, not what they want. And that's part of why it feels particularly difficult when you're looking for work, even as you see the overall unemployment rate start to move down. This is a, an issue nationally, too. It's not quite as bad, but you see that, too. So you see that 6% or 6.5% rate for the nation, you think, that's reasonable. But then, of course, there's these people who can't find full-time work and want it. So they're going to keep pushing. They're going to keep uh, trying to get full-time job. Uh, I threw in one of the issues, and I mentioned before, New York City has... Um, generally had higher unemployment rates than the nation. Uh, this is, and this is from 25-year-olds and up, it gives you time to uh, have gotten your credentials. New York City has a, a, a sort of an odd shape to its labor market. We have far more college graduates than the U.S. as a whole, and we have far more people who never finished high school. And of course, unemployment is very closely tied to education. So you put in a table that shows unemployment by education level, and you see for the college degree people, it's in the low single digits. And for the less than high school, it's in the upper teens to low 20s. So one of the reasons we have a high unemployment rate is the city has a large pool of people who have very low edu educational credentials. And we also, of course, have this high level of, you know, people with very strong credentials. And then, of course, in the, we're actually somewhat weaker in the middle. So when you hear about a lack of middle-class jobs, that's part of what they're talking about. The job market in New York City skews toward people who have very high credentials. Uh, you see somewhat the same thing in earnings. Uh, na compared to the nation, you actually make less as a high school dropout in New York City than the average they do nationally. And you can picture trying to live in an expensive place on New, uh, like New York City. And there is, of course, as, you, as the educational credentials climb, the differential starts to open up in favor of New York City. It is a high-wage city, but the high wages predominantly go to the people who have advanced degrees. I mean, overwhelmingly. You don't really get any significant opening in wage differential until you have at least some college credits or an associate's degree. This is uh, sort of interesting because it's not the way people picture it. About 60% of the private sector jobs are in Manhattan. So that's still the bulk of the jobs. But if you look back over the last decade, um, Manhattan is actually in fourth place in terms of job growth. We've had very rapid job growth in Brooklyn. It's almost 25% in the last 10 years. Uh, there's been a, an immense amount of development in the downtown area. Um, Businesses moving in. Big uh, professional services and business services cluster has formed there. Some financial company back offices. A lot of development of hotels, restaurants, stores uh, as neighborhoods have developed. So Brooklyn's had a lot of strong job growth. Um, the Bronx has actually done surprisingly well in terms of uh, residential-related development. So they've actually shown a fair amount of growth in um, middle and upper income people moving into the borough, and then you get growth in supporting jobs. You get um, 
personal services, dry cleaners open up, stores open up, uh, fitness clubs pop up. You start to get growth in ancillary industries that serve the local population. And of course, healthcare and whatever else to serve the population. Queens has been um, sort of in the middle and is probably the leader for doing best the next decade because of all the changes they're making in the Long Island City area. They're really pushing to job development in Long Island City. So we're gonna see a lot of what we saw in downtown and such Brooklyn is starting to happen in Long Island City now. And that's probably the next uh, big frontier, if you will. And Staten Island looks more like a suburban area in most uh, demographics. But uh, they're also somewhat hindered by the fact that the uh, job base on Staten Island is, is heavily weighted toward government jobs. And government has not been a, a growth area. You've probably heard a lot, you read the press, and you get a lot of stories about how everyone's now a part-time worker, and I sort of alluded to there has been some growth there, and how everyone's self-employed. No one can get a permanent job anymore. Um, the interesting thing is 77% uh, of the people are still on the payroll of a corporation, and another 13% are on the payroll of a government. So 90% of the people who have jobs are still on the payroll of a company. They're not freelancing. They're not self-employed. Uh, they may be doing some of that on the side. There's been a real growth in second incomes where people both have a job and do projects on the side. But primary income source is still mostly from uh, working for pay, uh, you know, on salary of a company. And the big shift the last, since before the recession, if you go back to 2007 and look at this data, the private for-profit sector was 66%, and the government was 15 So the, between 07 and 2012, the city added something like 30,000 jobs, 30,000 more employed residents. Uh, all the gain and more came in the nonprofit and and profit-making corporate sectors. There's been a, a large loss of government jobs and very little growth in self-employment. I mean, you hear about self-employment a lot, but the actual numbers show that self-employment has been relatively stable. And part of that is some of it's growing, and that stuff is, is really jazzy and sexy, and people talk about it in the magazines, you know, um, computer consultants and freelance graphics people, and that's always talked about. And of course, Reporters are in one of those industries that the internet is busily destroying. Uh, and every one of them is, knows someone who's been laid off or is working in, uh, is now working freelance or in some way has been impacted negatively by uh, technological shifts. So reporters in particular are very negative on freelancing and, and negative um, and self-employment. But beyond that gee whiz part of all these people doing, you know, complicated things for high pay. Most self-employment in New York City is people running small stores and people offering, offering personal services. Cab drivers, house cleaners, child care workers, all self-employed. So when you look at the largest self-employed occupations in New York City, it's not artists, musicians, actors, it's child care workers. And then you get taxi cab driver, and you get house cleaner, and then you start to see a complete shift into the artistic fields and the creative fields. But that's where the big move toward self-employment has been in mostly the artistic creative fields. And they've always had a high component of self-employment, but it's been growing. In many other areas, the biggest shift has not been that you're no longer on a company's payroll, but that they move you off one company payroll onto another. Uh, the largest shift while I've been uh, studying the job market has been companies taking all their different support functions and outsourcing them. So now the janitors and the secretarial pool and the IT support and, uh, and the call center and everything else is done by some other company. And you only have the core function left at, say, a big bank. And they've outsourced almost everything else. But most of those people are still on some other company's payroll. They've just shifted them off to a different company. Uh, the big change, again, this 2007, 2012, real big shift. At top line is managerial, professional, and creative occupations. That's where the growth has been. 
We've added over 80,000 jobs in, that, in those type of occupations in the, uh, since the 2007 peak. And the service occupations, which again are, are things such as the restaurant and hospitality industry, um, house cleaners, uh, security guard firms, those type of support and service firms are also showing a lot of growth. So you've got high end and low end, and then you move down, production of course, and transportation, some losses, construction, well, it was a big construction downturn, no surprise there, and sales and office occupations. It's the sales and clerical jobs that have taken the brunt of the downturn. There's been a huge shift inside the market. The overall numbers are relatively close between 2007 and 2012, but you have this huge shift of a plus 80,000 managerial professional and minus almost 60,000 sales and office jobs. And of course, just because you lost a sales job doesn't mean you can turn into a management worker. So there's this mismatch problem, too, that helps keep the labor market feeling difficult. There's a lot of economic demand, but it's for certain types of skills. And meanwhile, people are losing their jobs in other skill areas. Uh, these are the industries that have added the most jobs in the last 12 months. There's no zeros missing from this. You're used to the national numbers. You know, you're thinking, oh, it's 7.7 .7 million. Wow. Um, and you see the same sort of mix. There are low-end things. Home health care services are doing very well. Limited service restaurants are doing very well. There's some retail mixed in there. And then you start to see, well, colleges are doing well. Advertising has actually come on very strong the last few years. Um, performing arts. Wholesalers, durable goods wholesalers are actually showing some strength, oddly enough. And uh, you don't think of that as a growth industry. Computer systems design. There's been some movement in credit intermediation, which, which is our fancy term for what amounts to banking and credit and uh, credit granting organizations. Um, that primarily reflects the fact that our large financial conglomerates are changing the way they're structured. And they're actually adding people in, in some of the credit type operations at the same time as the securities and investment banking side is shrinking. So you might see the same company have overall unchanged unemployment, but they're laying off thousands of people in one area and bringing in thousands in another over a few years. So there's been a real shift here. So there's high end, there's low end. Um, some of this is driven by um, tourism. You know, the restaurant industry is doing well. The clothing store industry is doing well. That both serves the local needs and it serves the um, tourism industry. And you see advertising and computer systems. Professional industries generally have been strong. Uh, the exception is the legal industry. Um, it was a very, very steady performer for decades. Uh, it took a little bit of a hit uh, back in 2000, in the 2000 downturn, and a much bigger hit in this downturn. We had essentially a 10% job loss in New York City law firms in a one-year period during the downturn, and they've never really recovered. It showed a little bounce back in, in 2009, 2000, uh, 2010, 2011, and then it started slowly dwindling down again. It's relatively stable now, but there's no real growth there. And there have been some issues. A number of high-profile law firms have ended up in trouble, uh, overexpansion, expensive real estate leases, basically bad business decisions that a less forgiving market um, makes them pay for. I mean, if business was great and, and their hourly rates were still skyrocketing, then it wouldn't matter as much that maybe they overpaid for their real estate or promised some new pra uh, uh, part of their practice, excessive bonuses or whatever else they could cover it. But it's really been a, the standout weak area in the, in the professional industries has been um, legal services. The surprise strong area is actually the um, advertising agencies. I mean, we were worried for a long time about advertising because New York City uh, has an issue or had an issue that we are old line media. We have a lot of newspaper and magazine companies. We have a lot of TV companies. We have the big old advertising agencies who helped place ads in such media. And, you know, and advertising shifted into the, uh, I don't know what you want to call it onto the internet, into social media, whatever else. As it shifted, no one was sure that um, 
the New York City advertising industry would survive, or at least would continue to prosper. And in fact, they've made a reasonably decent transition. And we've seen a lot of growth the last few years. But again, one of the, uh, the issues you deal with is, if you've been in advertising and you have a lot of experience placing classified ads with newspapers, you know, that business is slowly going away. That doesn't make you particularly well suited to then transition into uh, social media management. Some of the gaffes they keep pulling on the internet, I'm not sure people doing social media management understand it too well either. Uh, but they're learning and they're slowly progressing and, you know, they are making it happen. And we've, we've really been successful. And again, I keep going through these trends. I was, of course, here for the dot-com thing. And uh, completely unexpected by anyone with absolutely no government intervention except not enforcing loft laws. We suddenly had this uh, collection of tech companies booming in downtown Manhattan. Unfortunately, most of them went broke. You know, and we didn't get most of the winners. And, uh, you know, when you, we had the dot-com boom going on, if you had taken all the smart people on Wall Street and said to them, I got a bet for you. When the smoke clears, the winner's going to be a bookstore, someone running a junk sale. You know, <laughs> you know they would have looked at you like, what are you, crazy? You know? Oh, and some guy selling, letting you look up things and then putting a map next to it. You know, what? You know? You know, so, but all the great ideas they put millions and billions behind, you know, web van and whatever else, pets.com, mostly they failed. And in some cases, the names got taken over by surviving companies, but most of those companies failed. And when the smoke cleared, we had Amazon and we had eBay, you know, and then slowly comes rising things like Google. But yeah, we really didn't see, we didn't really win in that round. But in this round, we seem to be doing a lot better. In the social media side, we've had a lot of big winning companies, you know, including Google, uh, really expanding in the New York City job market. We've done really well in that area, and hopefully this will help us going forward. It's one of the reasons the management side is so strong. Uh, a lot of that will be captured in computer systems, you know, or advertising-related services. We're having some interesting issues about how to code some of these companies. And it, and it doesn't necessarily relate to what kind of job they have. But we've really been successful there. And looking into New York's, uh, into 2014, uh, the strength we have is primarily coming from professional services, particularly advertising and computer, and uh, leisure and hospitality, helped by a real strong tourism market. And other than that, it's just serving the local needs of 8.5 million people who make a pretty good average salary. And I thank you. <laughs>